For centuries, humans have been growing alongside our botanical brethren. Our histories have mixed and mingled to bring us modern medical marvels, faded folklore, and everything in between. Of course, in order to understand the plant, we have to start with its roots. I'm M. Governor Gaddis, and this is Rooted. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Rooted. This week, we're covering a plant that is often a bit underappreciated due to its prickly nature, the thistle. To start, let's dig into some of the basic facts and features. Thistles are a part of the aster family, so they're related to daisies, sunflowers, and all kinds of other delightful plants. Thistles aren't actually just one plant, but a number of different plants all belonging to the Carduia tribe. For those unfamiliar, tribes are essentially the classification between family and genus, so it's a little more specific than family, but not quite as drilled down as the specific genus. This is an important subsection for the aster family, as it's a massive family with a lot of different and very unique plants. So it just helps us to break down those bigger families a little bit easier. Thistles are characterized by their super spiky leaves and stems, and their very specific flower shape. Most of them are shaped like cups at the base, with a bunch of tiny little spikes that just kind of poof out like jazz hands. And if you were to rip that flower open, you would find that inside they're filled with this light, fluffy stuff called thistle down, which helps them when they're ready to spread their seeds. Thistle, especially the biannual variety, is a really important plant in natural landscapes as it provides a vital source of pollen for bees and, and fertility butterflies, but it also helps to give homes for overwintering bugs and provides a lot of tasty seeds for birds like goldfinches and plenty of warm, fluffy down to line their nests with. The tall Cirrusum altissimum, or roadside thistle, is also a super important source of food for the monarch butterfly on its migration, as it's reliably found across North America. While it's really important for those guys, it can also cause a few problems if left completely unchecked in areas that it isn't supposed to be in. Because it has a tendency to grow in unruly, pointy thickets, it tends to not be a favorite for livestock. After all, the whole point of this old growing points was to stop it from being munched on. Because of that, and the fact that it can be toxic, it needs to be cleaned out of areas where wildlife is consistently grazing. As a fun fact, one method we have to try and control invasive thistle is to literally just release a bunch of weevils at it. They love to munch on thistles, which is a really handy way to get rid of plants we don't like, but one problem is that weevils aren't particularly choosy about the kinds of thistle they like to eat, so sometimes they kinda end up eating the good thistle too, which is why we need to be really mindful about where we're just randomly dumping our weevils. The duality of being both a wonderful source of food and a literal pain in the ass is part of the thistle's charm, even in human history. For instance, thistles became the national symbol of Scotland due to its role in helping the Scots win a war. Picture it if you will. The year is 1263, and it's a brisk, bleak October day in Scotland. The Norwegians have decided that they would like your land to be their land. And they're honestly being pretty rude and aggressive about it. You've been fighting them off for a while now, but it's getting to be pretty exhausting. You need a win. You decide to call it a night early and get your beauty rest to fight another day tomorrow. Excited to try a new strategy, the Norsemen decide to take advantage of your self-care because they want to stay toxic. They decide that in the cover of nightfall, they're going to tiptoe into your camp and give you the worst surprise of your life. However, what they don't know is that Scotland has its very own natural booby traps. You don't even have to go all home alone in your camp. Mother Earth has you covered. The Norsemen slip off their shoes, 
because they think being barefoot will make them sneakier somehow. And also I'm assuming because it makes for a much better story back home. The air is thick with ominous tension and a dreadful foot smell. This is their moment. As they're slowly tiptoeing across the field towards camp, one of the men full-on barefoot stomps a thistle, and that shit hurts. Caught off guard, he lets out a loud, BALDER, and wakes up everyone in the area. You rush to put on your shoes because you aren't an idiot, and you fight for your land. The Norsemen, embarrassed to have been bested by a freaking plant, decide they should just go home after yet another loss. And this helps you to finally turn the tides in your favor. Eventually, they decide to leave you alone altogether, and you finally live in peace for a bit, all thanks to a weed you also used to think was kind of a shit. And to thank it for its help, you make it a national symbol and decide to celebrate it for the tiny little prick it is, refusing to give up, even when the odds are stacked against it. But thistle is, and always has been, so much more than a symbol of strength, and we've relied on it for centuries, for food, medicine, and so much more. In food, the most obvious application is probably honey, as it's very popular and a significant source of food for bees. And therefore, it's a really easy plant to use for the all-the-rage single-source honey. Single-source honey from star thistle is said to have a very light floral taste. It's a rich golden color with a thick but light consistency. It also apparently smells like almonds and costs an average of about $2.61 per pound wholesale, according to the National Honey Report of February 2023 which is a real thing I just learned about and am newly obsessed with. I'll be linking it in the show notes if you'd like to join me in that madness. Anyway, at that price, the average cost you would expect to pay at the store, keeping in mind the average cost of this kind of fancy natural honey is about a dollar an ounce for 12 ounces, with a 30 to 40% markup, is about $15, compared to the average cost of about $7 for a standard grade A organic honey. So definitely a lot more expensive than the normal stuff, but maybe worth it if you're really into honey. But it's not just honey that thistle can make extravagant and budget busting. It's also a very important part of making the famous Serra da Australia cheese of Portugal. Basically thistle, specifically the cardoon or Cynara Cardoncolis thistle is a very good option for making vegetable rennet, which is essentially what causes the milk to curdle and separate into curds and whey, which talented cheesemakers then turn into cheese. This rennet is typically added to sheep's milk to make a cheese that is a little less consistent than those made with animal rennet, but also a bit more acidic, light, and with a thicker bite. According to Thistle Rennet fans, part of the fun is the inconsistency. Due to its shorter aging period, most cheese made with Thistle Rennet is only aged for about three months, the flavor profile from cheese to cheese can vary widely, making it rare to experience the same flavor twice, even from the exact same cheese maker. The Serra de Australia cheese is probably the best known cheese that consistently uses Thistle Rennet. It's a sheep's milk cheese from a specific region of Portugal and is made with only the milk of Bordelaria sheep. What makes it stand out is the rich, almost buttery curd of the milk, which is then made by hand into a sort of dough that then ages into a cheese. Said to have a slightly sour, creamy taste with a very soft texture, the cheese costs about $32 a pound, which is $26 more than a single pound of cheddar. In addition to cheese and honey, artichokes are another famous food that comes from thistles, mostly because it is one. So if you ever want to make a very expensive artichoke dip, just know you could technically make the whole thing out of thistles and it would be the height of artichoke dip culture. Now that you know how to make a very fancy charcuterie board to heal your soul, let's talk about how thistle was used to heal the rest of our bodies. That's right. 
it's time to talk medicine. For honestly, as long as we've had history, we've been using thistle as a medicine. Most notably, we've been using milk thistle, or Syllabum manarium, which is prized for its high concentration of silymarin, which is said to have antiviral, antibacterial, and anti-inflammatory properties. In ancient times, people in the Middle East used milk thistle to treat anything from liver disease to decreased breast milk production, and relied on it heavily as an addition to most medicines. In the medieval and early modern time periods, thistle was used to promote hair growth and to treat jaundice, the plague, cancer sores, and even vertigo. Which begs the question, is thistle the original Pirelli's miracle elixir? I think it could be, and honestly, I'm devastated that more Victorian orphan children didn't sing songs about it. Today, we still see thistle being used as a medical supplement, but not quite as widely, and without a ton of hard evidence to back up some of the more radical claims of it fighting liver disease and cancer. While it hasn't been completely ruled out, a lot more research is needed before we can know for sure how to best use it. One thing it is being used for is in pharmaceuticals, especially in the drug silibinin, which is used to help treat toxic liver damage and as a part of managing psoriasis and hepatitis. This works because silibinin is a flavonoid that helps to not only fight free radicals, but also has heptoprotective properties that protect the liver cells from further damage. In less fancy pants terms, silibinin slips into your system and helps to knock out the nasty little guys that sneak into your cells and wreak all kinds of havoc by essentially throwing them out and locking the door behind them. Milk thistle is still a super popular supplement for new moms as it's been shown to help mothers produce more breast milk and is also a popular additive to tinctures and other natural medicines due to its long history as an important, wild-foraged source of nutrients and medicine. While thistle is not a miracle cure, I hope learning a bit more about it has inspired you to at least keep an eye out for this pokey little friend, and to keep an open mind about the plants growing natively around you. Just because something can be a little bit spiny and hard to appreciate at first, doesn't necessarily mean it should be completely uprooted and banished. Take a little time to learn more about your native thistles and the ways they're actively contributing to the ecosystem around you. You might be surprised to know how much they're actually doing for pollinators and local artisans. Now normally, this is the part where I ask you to kiss their heads for me, but in this case, I would ask you instead to just give it an acknowledging nod, avoiding any spikes or weevils, and respecting the thistle's boundaries. Thanks so much for listening. I'll come at you next week with another episode, but in the meantime, I hope you have a lovely week and eat as much charcuterie as your heart desires. If you liked the show, Please consider subscribing and leaving us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you listen. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Rooted.Pod. We're on YouTube at Rooted.Podcast, and check out our website, RootedPod.com, for transcripts, updates, and so much more. Thanks for being here, and until next time, be kind to yourselves, be kind to the earth, and just like a plant, drink your water.